Blessings family. This is your brother Asar M. Hotep with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And it is Kaumba, aka Friday the 13th. But what better way to kick off this famous date than with an open forum discussion about the first two chapters that are scaring certain people in the community uh, in reference to my latest text Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt Volume 1 towards the meaning of the place named Kemet and so uh, hopefully those of you who have uh, gotten a copy already has been able to kind of peruse the text and um, at least have read the preface and parts of the introduction and if so, if you have any particular questions or comments pertaining to uh, those two chapters, then by all means ask. And if we don't have anybody that has any questions directly related to the text, then we can just make it about whatever. So, you know, uh, y'all sit back and relax, grab some notes, grab some popcorn, or some fruit if you are into that and we will be back in just a moment Peace, love, and light to each and every one of you who are joining the conversation around the world. I know it's uh, kind of late, depending on where you're at. I see uh, Brother Conan Lee in the building, and he's all the way in the UK, I believe. And uh, so I know it's late there, um, but it's after 10 p.m. here on the East Coast. And which means it's what seven o'clock or so on the west coast of the United States. And so just want to shout out each and every one of you. So peace and love to Sister Mika One, who is in the building, and Travel Light is in the building. OG Gorilla is in the building, and uh I, he's on the same coast as me, so I, I know he's up here late. Uh Edward. Nigma nine by nine is in the building. Teti Ursama Ra Seneferu is in the building, and Sister Gigi all the way on the west side of things is in the building. Dasharab is in the building, and Brother Jehuti Maat is in the building. And we are live on Facebook on the Harold Johnson account as well as the Asar M. Hotep. I'm not uh, streaming on X or Twitter uh, tonight, but um, of course we are streaming as well on YouTube. And so I just want to thank each and every one of you who have made yourselves known in the chat and uh, and then, of course, you know, all of you who are watching, but, you know, aren't in the chat necessarily and but uh, still showing support. And so uh, this is an open forum. So for those of you who are on YouTube, the link is pinned to the top of the chat. And if you're on Facebook, it should be in the comments. It should be one of the first two comments. 
uh, on Facebook on Asar and the HJ uh, page, as you can see. And, you know, before we get started, I just want to actually play the commercial and then I will talk a little bit about it. But go ahead. God Kush TV presents Sankofa, the future of black history, a unique Black History Month online series exploring all dimensions of time as we chronicle the black past, command the black present and empower the black future. Workshops include The Future is Black. Why is black history under attack? With Shakara, we create value, the ingenuity of enslaved Africans. With Robin Walker, Ancestral Calling, Agriculture, and the Apobo Library Initiative. With Aya Eveli, Quantum Field Theory as African Heritage. With Asa Imhotep. For full information including dates and the registration, visit gotkushtv.com. We have made history. We are making history. There is history still to be made. Sankofa, the future of black history. A Black History Love series not to be missed. That is right. Uh, make sure that you go to gotkushtv.com. And um, every Wednesday of this month, which out in the UK is their Black History Month. So over here in the United States, of course, you know, we celebrate in February and however in the uk and maybe other parts of europe they celebrate in october so our good brother uh shakara of uh, gotkushtv.com has put on an amazing series of of lectures um on every wednesday evening out there which i believe is 7 p.m in the uk which will be 2 p.m uh on uh est or east coast standard time uh, for those of us in the united states and so there is a nominal fee um to watch the lectures and so uh but if you get the lecture you're a you're unable to watch live while it's being um streamed it is being recorded so you have access to the lecture you know uh after it is uh live stream so if you don't worry about it, if you're going to miss it live you will uh still be able to to see it uh, um you know right after the live stream and so you know the uh, brother shakara spoke on the first wednesday let me just get these dates here so i remember so yeah on the fourth was brother shakara on um the 11th was brother robin walker and you know he was a uh, a guest on this program and this coming wednesday uh, is going to be the 18th and uh it is going to be sister aya let me get her last name correct uh before i uh so it's aya Inelli, and she's going to be speaking let me just share the screen real quick so y'all can see on got kush tv what we're talking about here so here is the website so uh shakara uh spoke uh, the title of his presentation was the future is black why is black history under attack and um i was watching live on this past wednesday with brother uh robin walker uh the the black history man is what they call him out there uh, he says, uh, excuse me, the title of his presentation was We Create Value, the Ingenuity of Enslaved Africans. So if you have paid for the series, you can still watch Shakara's presentation and Robin Walker's presentation. So this coming Wednesday is going to be Sister Aya Inelli, and she's going to talk about ancestral calling, agriculture, and the Apobo Library Initiative. And uh, the details and the analysis of each of the presentations are right here at the bottom of the homepage of Got Kush TV. And of course, on the final Wednesday, that is the 25th of October, I will be presenting uh, 
quantum field theory as African heritage. So it is rightly fitting because in the UK, it is Black History Month. But here in the United States, October is Black Science Month. And so I will be introducing some new concepts and and some correlations between modern quantum field theory and the traditional African conceptualization. And hopefully will inspire more of us to get into uh, in the United States, they will say STEM. But as I will be introducing into the conversation, it will be Ogun, the Ogun fields. And, you know, for those of you who will watch the program, you will get a breakdown of what that means. And so uh, I hope to see you all there um, for Sister Aya's presentation as well as uh, my presentation. And remember to go to gotcushtv.com to get your tickets so you can purchase them uh, right here individually or as a, a, a whole and it's cheaper as a whole than, than each one individually so uh please support the work and um i look forward to your feedback and give uh brother shakara tell him that you know brother asar sent you and i don't know if that will give you any discount or anything in the future but it, i'm pretty sure he'll be uh glad to hear um that I sent them your way. So I'll stop sharing the screen there. And so uh, let me see what's in the comments here. And we got Donnie Williams in the building. He says, oh, Lord, I don't know what y'all are talking about in the chat, but I'll just keep scrolling for now. And Zane Montego is in the building. ITM Hotep to you as well. Uh, thank you for joining the conversation and so um we are well let me pause right here and tell you where i'm at today so today was the start of the shek antadia conference international conference at temple university in philadelphia so this is the this year's uh booklet cover you can see uh, a younger Shekhansi joke in the back and you know I um, we had the preliminary part of the conference today so that's where I'm just coming from now and then all day on tomorrow our presentations from early in the morning going into the uh, beginnings of the evening and my presentation I go on at 10 40 a.m I'm on the second panel and you know you can this light is kind of bright so I don't know if you can see anything here so the title of my presentation is Osiris in the form of Shekhansi Joke what does it mean to be king? And so I look forward to that conversation. And, um, and then the next day, actually, uh, up here, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Vanessa Davies, who's an Egyptologist. We had her on the program before. But I'm going to be interviewing her for the China Into documentary film that i made y'all aware of uh last year so her interview is on uh sunday not tomorrow but sunday so um uh, tonight's conversation is um about the book the race and identity in ancient egypt volume one towards an etymology of the place named kemet and you know we won't be discussing the whole book uh i just want to preserve some space for those who have the book already and uh who may have read because we know we all got busy lives but you know hopefully y'all were able to kind of peruse through the text and get a feel for it 
And uh, hopefully you would have at least read the preface to the text and um, hopefully delved into the first chapter. So I'm giving you all an opportunity uh, to, you know, ask any kind of questions, you know, regarding those two chapters in the text and or if you don't have a question pertaining to the the chapters specifically if there's a question that you um want to know if i answered or had any kind of discussion on in the text itself you can ask those and so if we don't have you know any kind of questions for the night regarding that then it's kind of whatever you want. So if you want to join the panel, because it's an open forum, the link again is pinned to the top of the YouTube uh, chat. And um, it should be one of the first two comments in the Facebook uh, live stream in, in the comment section. So peace and blessings to you, uh, King J7. Thank you for joining the conversation. And let me see. Did I, did I see something else? No, I did not. Um, so what is this? Dr. Ryan said it's reverse psychology trying to get them back on here. I don't know what y'all talking about in the chat. I guess I got to pay attention. So, um, well, first and foremost, is any of y'all, um, you know, that have the text, you know, what is on your mind? And hold on, let me clear out some space here. And I'll move that out of the way. And I don't see anything in particular in the chat. And so he says, Donnie Williams asks, what claims are made, if any, in the book as far as what exactly the race was of the ancient Egyptians? Adasar, I appreciate your question. Now, I, I start to have that conversation in the text. And so that is, you know, introduced in the preface. But I don't really delve deep into the race question just yet. I'm reserving that for volume two because this one is is more geared towards the uh, the the meaning of the place name Kemet and to see if we can one find its etymology and two, does it have anything to do with their ethnicity or, or so-called race, right? In terms of that name, Kemet. And which my argument is that it does not um, in any shape or form. But in, in volume two, we're going to get into the details of defining more properly the concept of ethnicity, defining the concept of, of race, the the arguments for and against the concept of race how the um ancient egyptians are described by outside groups and how they depicted themselves and it's going to be a kind of a collaborative work because i'm going to have other scholars to address certain issues along those lines and they will be submitting uh, chapters along those lines as well. So um, I, I don't answer because, you know, as a as a scientist, I have to be careful about using that term race. And and what do you mean? Because when when it comes to the ancient Egyptians, you got to remember that. And this is something that I discuss in the preface of the text that there there has always been from a uh, small to large degrees, depending on the time period, uh, influxes of Asiatic people um, going in and out of Egypt, settling, marrying, having children and the like. 
and so when it comes to for example like let me let me just go into this part of the text right uh so there's there's a uh text by william cooney right so you're donnie williams but this is william cooney and he has a text titled egypt's encounter with the rest race culture and identity and it came out in 2011 and on page 18 he says the following he says being egyptian in the ancient world therefore is a complex phenomenon which cannot be tied exclusively to primordialist or instrumentalist perspectives of ethnic identity but is quite clearly a conflation of both of them an egyptian in quotes was not merely someone who lived within the boundaries of egypt nor a person who practiced egyptian religion or spoke egyptian an Egyptian could be all of these or none of these. Like ethnic identity in the modern world, ethnic identity in the ancient world was equally nebulous. That said, despite the often inclusive nature of Egyptian society, the Egyptians were also prone to exclude groups whom they considered to be different from themselves. This has created a lively debate within scholarly literature on the degree to which the ancient Egyptians were racist, right? And so I, I come back and follow and I ask and I state that provided that there have been numerous migrations between Egypt and the Levant since the fourth millennium BCE, and assuming that for the sake of argument, the original Egyptians were of a, spe a specific racial type and Egypt's territorial territory expanded from Nubia, Sudan to the Levant, how does one then define an Egyptian racially, provided that the great population diversity across such a vast territory, especially throughout Egypt's long political history, is asking what race were the ancient Egyptians a well-formed and scientific question? What do we mean by ethnicity? And did the ancient Egyptians see such a grouping in the, in the same way as we do in modern times? Regardless of our academic sense of ethnicity, did the actual skin color of the majority of the ancient Egyptians match that of the depictions we see of them on the walls and papyri? Do these skin tones match external descriptions of the ancient Egyptians? And then, you know, I go on to some other things. But I also cite in here, for example, a particular text is Berlin Papyrus 3090, where the Greeks are describing a priest and they describe this woman. They said that uh, her mother is uh, 50 years old, medium large, black woman with a broad face, right? So you are going to have some descriptions about, you know, people who lived in Egypt, but this is going to come late during the Greco-Roman times. And that's from when this text is uh, up. So this is in, it's published in a German text. I, I put the German here, but the, the relevant part I translated into English uh, for the reader. And so when it, when it comes to that particular question, what was the race of the ancient Egyptians? We have to be more specific because as I stated, since the fourth millennium, this is pre from pre-dynastic times to the Greco-Roman times, there have been Europeans and um, Asiatics who have been migrating and settling and intermingling and having children with the, with the ancient Egyptians. And so for those, of course, who were born uh, of those unities, and then of course, those who were just citizens of ancient Kemet were all Egyptians, right? So the kind of questions that we have to ask have to be a little bit more nuanced and more uh, concise, right? Because that saying who was an Egyptian, that's like saying who was a New Yorker, right? Like if you try to ask in this day and age, who is a New Yorker, then 
you you in in terms of what race were the New Yorkers, you it it, it wouldn't make any scientific sense because everybody and their mama lives in New York, and that's and and ancient Kemet was the New York of 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 Africa, right? And so so what I do in my research is I ask different questions in terms of what was the ruling population at the beginning of Egypt's uh, emergence as a state? What kind of other evidence in terms of biology can we um, get, you know, whether it's in, in bone measurements, whether it's in DNA, et cetera, et cetera, from pre-dynastic times, right? And also, you know, in terms of culture and language, how do the ancient Egyptians cluster in regards to other groups? Because cultures exist just like genetics exists in a continuum, right? And certain groups cluster together more than others, like African uh folks in congo cluster closer to people in nigeria and southern africa right more than they do genetically with folks in that are a native to you know um colombia or or california or new mexico etc right like that we can look at the dna and tell that you know these these groups historically are are far apart although all the evidence shows that most all human beings derive ultimately out of africa but in in the context of who clusters together and we can do this same type of analysis when we're talking linguistics when we're talking uh culture worldview um and and other themes, right? So if, if we're finding, for example, all of the major themes coming out of ancient Kemet that exists naturally across the continent, you know, like Ma'at, Amen, Ra, Pata, um, burial rituals, right? Uh, family, you know, names. Um, uh, religious concepts, right? You know, burial rites, education ways, you know, certain crafts and the like. If these, if if we're finding the same things in in Congo and Nigeria and in, in Mali and Senegal and in South Africa as what we find in ancient Kemet in terms of mummification, right? The 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 leopard skin representing priests and kings, right? If we're we're finding all this, but we're not seeing this type of thing naturally in Asia or Europe, then you know we know that ancient Kemet clusters with uh, Central and West Africa, for example, and so the only way that these could um, exist is is if they all descend from the same mother culture, right? And, and spread out over time. And we have techniques to, to uh, assess and, and to make those arguments. So this is, you know, this is in part what this, this, this text does. So that for those who try to skate around, for example, the, the race question, um, and in trying to use, for example, DNA from from Greco-Roman mummies to, to to argue about the ancient Egyptians, then then we have a um, you know we we have other means to to make arguments uh, along those lines. So I appreciate your your commentary, and let me go to. Dasharab, he says, the remetch of concern where black is shown in every wall. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, for example, let me put.
pull up. I'm just going to go on the web. Ancient Egyptian army. Right? Now, you, you have to wonder, for example, oh, no. Um, right. I'm going to share my screen. And we'll just do the entire screen so that y'all can see. Uh, can y'all see the screen? Hopefully y'all can see uh, what I see. So like, for example, when you look at uh, the the raw material, when you see the military, for example, you don't see the military looking anything other than African, right, in, in various types. So, like, I just typed it in. Of course, you know, you have these, for example, in a modern recreation, they make the, the soldiers look like... Uh, um, Europeans, right? Like in this image here, I don't know why it's coming out so small, but it's saying something else. So, so you see how when they when they make these fake uh, <laughs> new artistic art forms, look how they make the, the the ancient Egyptian armies look, right? But when you go onto the walls of ancient Kemet, this is how the army looks nothing like these folks here and then of course when you have the wooden statues right why all the wooden statues have folks with with afros and spears and and nylotic body plans right you don't ever ever see a standalone objects like this where the 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 people look like this or even the people who are paraded as modern egyptians today right so this is this is problematic and this is one of the things that we're trying to address in the text you know based upon how the egyptians depicted themselves right like here's here's some more to, you don't see white folks or pale folks in the military, right? And for them to be constantly at war with others, you would think that, you know, just like in the United States today, how they, you know, they, they promote the military, they it is mainly white folks, but you don't see that on the walls of ancient Kemet. And, and they'll try to say that these are wigs. For for anybody who has done any kind of military service, what 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 tactical advantage would you have as soldiers running around here with Afro wigs? Right? That that, that doesn't even make any sense. Like these aren't wigs; these are their actual hair. This is these are this is how the ancient Egyptians depicted themselves, right? And and we have to respect the ancient Egyptians and how they depicted themselves. So so hopefully, um, that that helps to 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 answer the question, uh, or or to reinforce the statement that you made, uh, Dasharev. And Zane Montego asks, he says, my only concern is the governance and the functionality of Egypt. I don't care if they were extraterrestrials, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, I don't know where that part of the conversation came from. And peace and blessings to Zoo 221 in the building and 42 tribes is in the building. And did I miss anyone else? No, I did not. Um, or at least I don't think I did. And so again, this is an open forum and we are talking about the book. If you have the book and you, you know, you ran into something that's a little bit more difficult and you need 
you know, some some explanation. I am here. I am open um, to to the discussion because this um, in, in certain parts, I assume is not an easy read. And, you know, there's a lot of information here and some things will need to be um, explained if you're not familiar with the methodology and the strategies used in the text. And Boyd Shutrop says, good question. He says, whole army mess around and pass out exactly. <laughs> uh, we we don't have, um, and that, that's, that it just makes no sense, the, the kind of arguments that people are making in regards to the ancient Egyptians. And, and so we're, they're in the hot, the hot desert running around trying to kill people and to keep their wigs on. So, um, let me see. It says, Asar, do you have a stance on Eros Manic's book, Ethnic Identities in the Land of the Pharaohs? I've heard you speak on him before. Um, I do, but I would have to kind of peruse the book again and look at my notes to to see what particular like certain there's there's a lot that i agree with him with but there's certain things that i disagree with him with and because of, of course he doesn't have the tools of historical comparative linguistics or or africology to to have the the proper lens because what's 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 problematic about Urus Maddox's book and even the one that I cited in this text is this is what they're going to do. What they're, what they're going to do is say that, well, the ancient Egyptian civilization was so heavily mixed that who's to say, you know, what the race is, like the race isn't important, right? And and so this is why you have to come from the angle of, you know, like, like check on to joke, check on to joke, you know, took it all the way back to the beginnings of man and man's migrations out of Africa and, and dealing with, you know, like the Gloger laws, you know, and the skin pigmentation becoming dark due to the sun and then going to this particular latitude and people settling there. And this is one of the reasons why he did his analysis with um, Wolof language, right? Showing that these two languages are closely kin. And when we start, you know, adding up all of the evidence, the ancient Egyptians could only have come from the, the, the same place and from the same people that, for example, the Yoruba and the Wolof and the Fulani in in uh, Sierra, et cetera, et cetera, and the people of Ghana uh, originally came from, because we're seeing all of these different things here. So it makes sense that there was an original place in Africa from which these people spread over time, then to argue that this random race of uh, uh, unknown uh, Hamites came into Africa and then civilized all of Africa right and gave gave the africans the language see that was the the hypothesis or the explanation of the late dr um lilius homberger who was one of shekanta geops uh first linguistic teachers right when you read her book on the the negro languages of africa she's making the argument that the ancient egyptians who who were white or, or, or belonged to that milieu came and interacted with all the Africans and all the modern African languages are, uh, are, are in essence kind of bastardized ancient Egyptian languages uh, uh, from the ancient Egyptians. So the, the, the ancient Egyptians, you know, uh, interacted with and migrated and gave the Negro Africans their their modern languages and that the modern negro languages are actually ancient egyptian languages which are you know came from out of asia or whatnot so it's this this hamatic hypothesis 
because you know Lilius Holmberger is seeing scientifically the relationship between ancient Egyptian language and, for example, Fulani and Sierra and Wolof and um, and in Bantu, right? She's seeing all of this in, in certain uh, Sudanic languages. She sees this clear as day, but her cognitive dissonance and just her Eurocentricity refuses to see it as that these are related languages to the ancient Egyptian. And therefore the ancient Egyptians had to come out of the, the dark black African sub-Saharan you know, context and landed in Egypt versus Egypt came this singular language and culture came and influenced all of Africa. So these are the kinds of, you know, arguments from the early days that still in, in many respects linger on. And so this is, this is, you know, they're trying to make these arguments in different ways. So now what they're trying to do is make it to seem like, well, it was just a multicultural, a multi-ethnic group. And there was no, uh, you know, racial categories and, and, and the like. And but they're still trying to cluster the ancient Egyptians with people out in Asia and try to minimalize and diminish the the quote unquote black African uh, correspondences in which they see. So they see the work of of the Diopian schools making arguments that they can't refute. So now they're trying to change the strategy and make it to you know and try to emphasize the the influx of asiatics into this african society and so now that they're you know it's, it's almost like and uh how people are trying to like like certain puerto ricans are are saying you know that they are at the foundations of of, of hip-hop and jamaicans trying to say that they're the foundation of hip-hop they're not the foundation of hip-hop you know and and that's a debate i'm i'm willing to have and and I can make successfully, right? But you you have a few Puerto Ricans who came to the party, but now they want to make it seem as Puerto Ricans were 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 putting in these cultural elements that became hip hop. No, they they saw the vibe that the African Americans have created. And they were attracted to it and landed and came to some of the parties, you know, because in the early 70s, Puerto Ricans and blacks were not close in New York. Right. There was there was there was different things going on, different political movements, different music movements, and they they lived and existed in different neighborhoods. Right. And and so, you know, now there's a large debate now, all of these people coming in and contributing and making hip hop uh, culture. And and that's not the case. You know, there's no strong Jamaican element that that makes hip hop culture. And there's no strong Puerto Rican element. Right. And it's the same thing with with ancient Egypt. And so they're trying to make it this melting pot, multi ethnic, you know, all these ideas converge you know, there, and it's a, a whole bunch of stuff coming from, from Asia, and there was some minor sub-Saharan African input, as, as what they would say, right? So, so these are the things that we have to be, you know, very cognizant of and very nuanced in our research, and we got to be very specific and define things uh, concisely so that you don't give people wiggle room to try to make other arguments. Right. So let me kind of scroll back up. Um, he says, I may get it next weekend. I'm catching up on a bunch of reading. I understand, brother. Thank you for your support. Exactly. They wouldn't say that Rome was so mixed that race wasn't important. Exactly. Thinking of Kemet as a federation, do you build further on different ethnicities within Kemet versus race? That's going to be uh, the well, part of the focus and discussion in part two, because part one was, you know, dealing with the the, the main thing on the on the Kemet question itself, and and so I, I build up the space to now have that deeper discussion in what you're asking right now, uh, brother Zoo two two one. 
And the native Pharaonic Egyptians were homogeneous from pre dynasty times up to the Greco Roman times, despite there were a lot of foreign people living in um, Pharaonic ancient Egypt. And, matter of fact, uh, it's, it's when you read the records, you can see that other groups were there, but they retain not necessarily they retain their native names, but they were names given to certain groups especially those who who lived in the delta right they created basically kind of chinatowns in in the delta region right but the the influence and the culture and the dominant folks came from the black africans and it is is and that's why you got to emphasize these things and do this in a very systematic and scientific way when you're demonstrating these correlations in um amongst the other groups and to to avoid the conversations that were that would be due to either uh migrations of ancient egyptians into africa or uh, you know or or trade and stuff like that so people want to overstress that and it's like no we can talk about that there's a there's a conversation and a space for that However, when you want to make this argument on the Africanism on the ancient Egyptians, you want to note that and separate that information from the authentic inheritance argument. So my my arguments have to deal and focus with the inheritance of ancient Egypt. That's why for the film is Chiana into the into family. So once you understand the into family in the in the cultures and the expressions of that culture, thought, and praxis in these particular regions, then you can understand the the the, the role and position that ancient Kemet was in within the family dynamic, right? And so these are the ways that we that I suggest that we make these particular types of arguments. The, what a half-ass theory from her. Yeah, yeah. talking about uh, Dr. Lilius Holmberg, right? The Wolof people in Senegal practically speak the ancient Egyptian language. Funny that isn't it. Exactly. All black, everything, hence Kemet. Is it okay? Uh, and orange covering eyes. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, let's, let's let Star handle. Uh, uh, Jamon B. Carson talks about the Anunnaki creation. Do you have a take on that? Um, n- not so much. Like, I'm I'm not into that school that has a a, a strong emphasis on the Anunnaki. I don't I don't know how that even became a thing. Like, I understand it from the standpoint of just um, ancient Sumerian you know worldview and thought uh but whether that is related to anything or not i i have no no idea uh zay montanga so wait so there's a race based african um if you can clarify that if you can um yeah clarify that question for me i'll, I'll repost it and, and address it um i'm not quite sure what you mean by that question they kind of vary in King 7 for sure. So many different regions have different aspects, which are clear corollaries and remnants. Again, talking about the Wolof language in relation to ancient Egyptian. And Sister Mika reminds everyone to... That's right. Make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe. And, you know, I'm trying to hit 10,000 plus subscribers. So, you know, we're a good ways there. Just need another 2,000, you know, not much, just 2,000. So tell all your friends and colleagues to hit up the channel and subscribe and we can increase uh, our reach and start spreading the good gospel of black African power. Anyway, 
uh, let me see. The, the Somalians also have some close linguistic similarities to ancient Egyptian uh, language. Indeed. Um, let me see. Also, there are 20 plus historical authors from the time of biblical Moses to early medieval times that mentioned that there were Ethiopians, Mauritanians, Kushites, and the Egyptian colony of Colchis. And read the book Expedition for the Survey of the Rivers of Euphrates and Tigris when on the British coming in. He was like, nah, 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 nah. and there's there's some stuff I have ready on on the description. So volume three is just going to be citations. This is going to be a reference book of citations dealing with external descriptions of the ancient Egyptians, right? And Black to Egypt TV, peace and blessings to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Gina A is in the building, says, hey, do you know who else's language is similar to the ancient Egyptians? There's a whole bunch of, of languages. Uh, you know, I deal with Shiluba Bantu and Ki Congo. We can deal with the Yoruba language. We can deal with the Akan language. There's just many languages, you know, uh, the Songo language, Zande, you know, uh, it is is really all of is really for the most part kind of all of Africa. But you don't want to say all of Africa till you've actually put in the work. And so these languages that I mentioned there have been work done to show the uh, the relationship between those languages and the ancient Egyptian. And so this is why I always stress to folks who try to look for a more religious connection to ancient Egypt and feel that if they learn the 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 terms and 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 deities of ancient Egypt that it has like more weight to it. It's it's not it is it's not um like that. If if you deal with Yoruba language, you'll have the same words in the Yoruba language. If you learn Shinuba, if you learn King Congo, if you learn Wolof, you will have the same terms. If you learn Chui, you know, Ga or Bini language, Hasa, you'll have the same words. And matter of fact, again, my presentation tomorrow at the Shekanta Diop conference is dealing with Osiris, Osir. So I'm be dealing with the collagen, the Acholi uh, language, uh, the collagen, the Acholi, and the Doluo languages on tomorrow, as well as the Wolof in, in Chiluba. And so when you're talking about Osir, of course, it is in all those languages, the, the Acholi, the Doluo, and the um, collagen language, right? Uh, languages, I should say. You know, Choli's really kind of Doluo. But um, so you have Osir, Osiris in those languages, but then you also have it in the Yoruba language. And but it's 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 pronounced differently because there has been some sound change. So when you talk about the god Eshu, Eshu is the native form of Osir in ancient Egyptian and Ocholi and collagen language when when you when you say the you know wasp scepter or wisir right you you're in the yoruba language you would just say ashe ashe right there's an ashe dealing with command and power like the wasp scepter but then there's also an ashe scepter that 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 the ogboni society you know, um, carries around. It's the same, like when you'll see the wasp scepters and all up in Ghana and in 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 Benin and places uh, going further west and in the Sudan, right? So how do people in Ghana and, and even as far as uh, Gambia and Senegal have wasp scepters, right? Like, like it's, it's, it's so much that we can show and that's why we have to have you know uh text that that we can you know kind of lay these things out and not simply have uh conversations uh on the net and let me see uh Zaymon, he said earlier you said something along the lines of black african so i'm wondering are you making mention of white africans no I, i'm Usually when I said that, that's why I, I put the quotes, because 
you you have folks who who want to um utilize this this true negro myth and hypothesis and so they only count you know africans if they look like people who came from nigeria and and you know mali right or congo so if, if you look like those people in in those regions then those are the real black africans everybody else are not you know they had to come from somewhere else you know in terms of like berbers the ancient egyptians the somalians the eritreans even though those folks on that coast do have a lot of admixture with people coming across from uh yemen and saudi arabia but you know like like Fulani, like these 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 other types like i have a book it's called uh, Pygmy Kitabu. Is uh, I'm a, the name is Pygmy Kitabu. It was written in the 70s. And this author is trying to claim that the Batwa, the, the Pygmies, in the so-called Pygmies in the Ituri forest and the like, are really Caucasians who, who came and settled into Central Africa, right? Like any, like, like they, they, they want to play around with who's African depending on, you know, if they, if they find something worthy, you know, in terms of their culture or technology, well, it must be the result of the interactions and settling of Caucasian people into Africa. So those people are no longer true Negroes, right? Like the Fulani are not true Negroes. So you know they they don't count as as native africans right so it's it's a lot of bs that you have to sift through when you're going through the historical record she said gina a says i mean the cops asar so let me go back because i kind of forgot your statement so let me he says hey do you know who else's language is similar to the ancient egyptians and And you said the cops were, well, we were talking about in terms of, of course, not outside of the territory of Egypt. So we wouldn't, when, when we say the Egyptian, the assumption is that Coptic is the last stage of Egyptian. So if that, if that is the argument, then of course the, the Coptic language would be similar to ancient Egyptian, which there are major differences in which why, for example, Jean-Claude and Boley, um, argues that Coptic was a separate language. And, and I don't think he is the only person who has made that argument, but he has, he, he does his own linguistic grounds. Um, and she says, I haven't finished your book yet. It's a heavy one. I appreciate it. Thank you. And um, yeah, it's going to take a minute. That's why I'm trying to have these conversations. So if people, you know, you know, have uh, any questions on why I mentioned something the way that I did? What did I mean when I said this? Why, you know, can you explain this? Like that, you know, I'm, I'm open to the community so that you can ask me these questions and I can answer them as best as I can. So um, uh, I thank you again for your support. And, um, and so hopefully, you know, in terms of the relations, that's one of the reasons why in appendix a and appendix b um i i hit you with you know hundreds of sound meaning correspondences between ancient egyptian and modern african languages because again we're you know we're playing we're playing chess right so i'm, I'm, I'm setting i'm setting some arguments up for for future publications and and so that they can't get around those things. Um, you see, sometimes people unfortunately depend on you not reading. <laughs> Indeed. Um, he says, greetings, uh, Lothario Cartwright, if I'm saying that correctly. Thank you for joining the, the program. And uh, they ask, greetings, what about Swahili? Is there a connection to other African languages? Um, are you talking about 
if I understand your your question correctly, are you asking is Swahili related to other African languages, or is ancient Egyptian related to Swahili and other African languages? You know, if 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 that makes sense. So please uh, clarify. And I know there's going to be a little time delay, so I'm gonna come back to your your comment. And but I will just say off the bat that. You know, Swahili is a Bantu language, and um, and it, and it is my argument and a few other scholars' argument that Egyptian actually belongs in the into Bantu side, you know, of the equation, and we have our reasons why, uh, which we won't get into the detail here. But you'll see many of those arguments in Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume One. And so, peace, love, and light to Brother Conan Lee. Uh, thank you for your donation um, and your donations help to keep the the channel going so that we can bring you this this valuable uh, information and interviews. And speaking of interviews, if you have not checked out our latest interview, uh, we interviewed Sister uh, Evelyn and Brother Baioku uh, Duduyemi of the Kibole Bole Educational Institute. And we talked about agriculture, education, ecology, and family. They are uh, Africans um, born in America, uh, but who, who have repatriated back to Africa, um, you know, the land of their ancestors. Uh, they decided to move a little further over there into Tanzania. And so we interviewed them live in Tanzania. So they're they're Tanzanians now via Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, you know, we had a good uh, interview. So this was the last interview that we uh, did on the channel. So please uh, go back and uh, check out this interview because we're going to be dealing with a lot of uh, agricultural stuff as part of a new initiative which you can uh, kind of get the vibe of right here. Again, this, uh, you know, been researching this, the the meaning of the place name Kemet uh, for 20 plus years off and on. And, you know, uh, it, it forced me to delve deep into the agricultural sciences and study. And, and it is that research which has inspired the movement of Qigong, you know, a modern way of saying the word Kemet. But we uh, kind of extended the A's to kind of uh, reflect more so the Cameroonian Bantu way of, of saying the word for farm. They say kam or ekam, uh, which it would be a variant of chikam, uh, which you see here. So, you know, we'll have more on this uh, in, the, in the future. We've already had a little kind of introductory show on Qigong, which is a philosophy, paradigm, and praxis. So we're going to be having more of these types of interviews when we're dealing with, you know, agriculture, ecology, biomimicry, and the like. And so um, Brother Baoku and uh, Sister Evelyn have kind of uh, initiated that uh, series of, of conversations and the initiative. So let me go back here. Uh, let me see. And Gina says, totally agree that it's similar to Yoruba. Would you say it's got any similarities to Fula? Uh, if you're talking about ancient Egyptian, yes. As a matter of fact, if we use the Mboli model, um, the, the Fulani and Wolof languages and Sierra, they would be what we would call a, uh, a Biher language. And so uh, let me kind of go into the banners. Let me 
we move that up and create one. So you have Bere versus Beher, right? So let me put that up there. So Bere versus Beher. So the the Wolof languages, the Fulani and whatnot, will be what we would call a Beher language. And these are different words for liver. So in the, um, I believe it's in the Zande, they say Bere for liver. And, but the same cognate in the Somali language is Beher. And we can tell by the syllabification that, you know, there was a different linguistic process that makes the words be pronounced in these different ways. So you can see that the first one is consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel versus the Somali variant, which is consonant, vowel, vowel, consonant. And so the what Emboli argues is that the Coptic language is a bear language. And this is why the Wolof, Lani, Seir, and those groups, because they are also bear languages, are closer more so to the Coptic, whereas the Middle Egyptian is of Bere. And this is where like your Bantu languages, this is how they form these cognate words. And there's a there's a whole process for which we can de uh, determine the formation, the standard formation of the words in um, these particular languages. So, but yeah, you're, you're right on that. And uh, Donnie Williams says, you should sit down with the rhetorical questions. Um, I don't even know when, Y'all talking about here? He said, um, "Hold on, let me go back." Yes, brother, that's all. that is what I was asking. It's Swahili connected to Kemet and other African languages. Thank you. Yes, um, and I and I believe that this is a question that comes up a lot because there's a lot of Arabic loan words in Swahili. So at one point in time, for professional linguists, uh, some have proposed that Swahili was not in African language, but a, a deep analysis of, of Kiswahili shows that it is an African language. It just has um, a large amount of loan words from Arabic, but the Bantu vocabulary and the Bantu, the Bantu grammar uh, is in abundance that you could not mistake it for anything other than a, an African language and more specifically a Bantu language. And um, and so again, going with the Bere versus Be'er uh, language structure or or word structure, you can kind of see in what class uh, the the Coptic goes into. Coptic belongs to Be'er, um, and you know, but they already have a name. I don't get that. Why Chikam? Chikam. So this is what you got to understand: the word Kemet itself doesn't only exist in the ancient Egyptian language. That word exists all over Africa. And so in the Bantu, in the Baluba language, for example, let me go back to my banner. So let me, I'll keep that one for now. So let me create another banner. So you have, so we're going to do it just like this. Kemet becomes this equals chi kam, or you can say e kam, or you can say bu kam, um, or for example in Yoruba you can say e ga, right? So. So these are cognate terms in African languages. So that what is a what is suffixed in um, ancient Egyptian, the T suffix, it is prefixed in other in 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 many of the Bantu languages. So the T suffix in ancient Egyptian corresponds to the chi or ki prefix in Bantu. And so for these languages, the cognate, they would say chikam or just kam if they don't have that grammatical uh, um, morpheme 
long longer lengths. Like there's some uh, Cameroonian Bantu languages that don't have that uh, prefix anymore. There's only there's there's one language where do you have that remnant? They say ekam, but that ekam comes from ki or chi kam, and or you can they substitute the the suffix because the t suffix is a suffix of place, and it also serves as the abstract in the ancient Egyptian language. So you'll also see like among in in the Congo, there's a um, place called bu kam. Bu is the um just like in ancient egyptian it's a prefix of the abstract and it's a prefix of place so when you say bu or uganda bu or uganda is also another cognate of the word kemet right you have a whole country named kemet it's just in the form of buganda just like you have in central uh congo bu Khan. and in the yoruba language the cognate for the word chikam or kemet is egan. And this is all discussed in the text. So you have to understand, first and foremost, that uh, languages do not exist in isolation. They belong to a family of languages, and you're going to find cognate terms. These are, these are terms that have been demonstrated to uh, have existed in the mother culture, the mother language, the mother tongue. And these modern forms in these various different languages that you're seeing here, you know, they all derive from the mother uh, language. And so these are just modern forms of the same one. So we're not, when I say Chikam, I'm not saying that the ancient Egyptians pronounced it that way. Chikam is a modern African word. And so for the philosophy praxis and um, of, of Chikam, which in terms of our initiative, that's what we're calling it instead of Kemet. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and I want to give a shout out to Zoo221 for also uh, his contribution and donation to the channel. I uh, appreciate it very greatly. And I saw another one. Oh, and Sister Gina says, sorry, I have so many questions. Thank you for taking the time. No problem. That's that's what this open forum is for, uh, so that you, you can ask questions. And so uh, thank you, you know, for your... Uh, your donation and for your your questions and uh, let me kind of scroll back up uh let me see so yeah let me see. says sat 12 sorry on wikipedia entry for kim they have the four cows male calves at ramesses the third are you saying the glyphs there are not indicating colors or the calves um no they're not they're indicating colors but it's for a different it's for a different reason and when you actually look at the paint of the cows it, they're not painted those colors and i don't even know why people try to use that um as an uh as an argument and it wouldn't be a, a relevant argument anyway because no one is arguing that the ancient egyptians did not have a km consonant sequence that can be defined as the word black so that that has nothing to do with the word kemet which is a place name for the country and so that's that's what has to be you know understood and in you know this is why it's, this is why you have to to put the stuff in in text so people can read because you if you listen to folks who be on the internet who don't read They'll try to make you, they'll try to uh, make other arguments that nobody else is making and then try to say that that's the arguments that you're making. My arguments are in print. You can you can quote me directly on what my arguments are. And so um, let me see if I can, because I, I, I've done a, let me see. Um, Oh, wow. 
one sec. Let me see, because I, I know I did a show on that relatively recently, and I'm trying to see if I can pull it up. Rasta got soul, reggae music, rocking my bones. My bones, it's never getting cold. Reggae music more and more and more. Y'all know nothing about that. Anyway, I'm gonna share my screen. Right now I'm gonna do the entire screen. Let me hide that and let me make it kind of full screen so that y'all can see. So, uh, so this is the, um, the relief that you're talking about. So I've made it full screen, so hopefully you can see. So here's, here's the hieroglyph for the word Kim, right? And here's Desher. And then here's um, hedge for white. So notice that this is the hieroglyph for white, but the cow is painted black. And it looks like it may have had a kind of a, a white patch, but this is not a white cow. And this cow here is actually the reddish brown. It's not Kim. And this is supposed to be uh, a word uh, this is the uh, kind of skin of, of, of cattle where it's kind of used in that context for a, a spotted animal. For um, And you can see this is kind of grayish. And it's not the case that it's like the paint wore off, you know, in a different way. So uh, hold on one sec. So you can kind of see this ritual. It's 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 all over Kim. It's it's a it's a, a ritual for um, pulling the the cattle in four different directions, right? And and you can see another one here on Ramesses II. It's called driving the four cows into the presence of Amun Ra, Kamutef, right? And, you know, on this one, you can say that the color has faded, right? And so this one, you can still see a bit of the red on it, but you can see the same uh, uh, one. So this would, this would be an example of the, the paint, because you can see, like, I'm, you know, again, I don't know what devices y'all are on when y'all are watching this, but you can kind of see on the, um, on, on Pata here, like the, uh, the kind of necklace here, you can see the fading of the blue and the fading of the red and more blue here. So, but like most of the paint on all this other kind of stuff is gone, gone, all right? So this would be a good example, but you see here the, the chem glyph for the, for the cattle, right? And, and here's hedge for white, but they're not painted white. Well, this is just another, uh, this is in the presence of Kansu. So this is a common theme, you know, and, and here's here's the actual full. Um, um, uh, this is a different one here, but you can see again. No, this is I think this is the same one. So this isn't an issue, for example, of all the paint being um, uh, off because you can still see the the coloration in these areas, even though it, it's, it's fainted to a, um, a little bit, but this isn't a white cow. This isn't a black cow. This is, this cow is actually reddish brown, which you, you can clearly see the paint here. And, and it's reinforced by being um, in this relief here. Like you can see, cause this was at, at once uh, kind of painted white that you can see. So you can see the white fading here. So this is white, but not this, uh, see, see, this is the the hedge for white, the the glyph for white. So we can clearly see what white looks like on this relief here. And this is not, the, excuse me, this is not the color. You can see a little bit of reddish here for Desher, but this is the same color as this this cattle here, this cow here. 
So there's something else going on. And and that's what I discussed in that um, particular uh, lecture. So that's that's the relief that you were talking about. And I'll stop sharing the screen uh, there. Peace and blessings to Rich the African Elder and peace and blessings to Brother Chavez in the building. And he says that T turns the verb into the noun Kemet. Uh, Kam Yasharala. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's called an abstract. Uh, it's a T of abstraction. And King says, hey, so do you think that there are any cognates to the Egyptian deity Atum in Africa? <laughs> yes, this is uh, something that I deal with on the regular um, in the text. And so if you want to know the cognate um, to the word Atum, uh, I'm going to give you at least one cognate. So the word atom is in, well, let me do it like this. Egyptian atom is equal to Kikongo Kalunga. All right. So let me put that there. So here's here's one cognate for because atom is is the complete being, and the cognate for it in um, Kikongo is Kalunga, the completely complete being. So let me see if I can find. Uh, something because i know i had it big sean bob big up yourself um let me see if this one because it's also because i want to show the one where i'm dealing with autumn though because that that word kalunga there's a there's a variant of it that is cognate with uh, ma'at as well, but that's not the one I want to show. Um, let me see if I let um, Well. It's, it's funny that you ask that because I'm dealing with Atom in my, so I'm, I'm gonna give y'all a preview uh, of my conversation that I'm gonna have in uh, um, on the 25th, right? So, cause I'm gonna be dealing with Atom. So I won't tell you the the, the context in which I'm having a discussion with Atom, but I will share this aspect of it uh, because I've, I've I've shared it um, before on my channel, so uh, it'll be a refresher. So when you're dealing with the word Lunga or Kalunga, as Fukiao deals with in his African cosmology of the Bantu Congo, you'll come to find out that Kalunga is the basis, is based off of this phenomenon that we call paronymy, which I introduced to the community uh, on, on, matter of fact, you know, every time we have a conversation because it's so central to uh, African, the development of African beliefs and practices, right? And so this is the belief that two words that sound alike must be connected in some way. And so what African people would do is kind of converge concepts that are separate linguistically but because they sound the same they they're interwoven and they're part of the process for developing uh myths and other rituals and um and beliefs so when you when you say ka is a, a prefix in kikongo and the root is lunga and we won't go into all but you know i'm, I'm citing fukiao but then I go into the dictionaries and I'm showing you that there's in the uh, in the Kikongo language, there's a word lunga that means fire. There's a word lunga that means ocean. There's a word lunga that means complete. 
There's a word Lunga immense, Lunga master, Lunga spirit, Lunga order, Lunga protector, Lunga transformation. These are all different words, right? But they've they've kind of come to sound the same. And the the Bakongo people have exploited that. And so now I'm showing that the word Kalunga, because uh, um Hold on. Fukiao lets us know. Uh, so that is the Kalunga complete force by itself fired up the Mbongi, a fire force complete by itself. Because he's he keeps he keeps talking about this concept of Kalunga in in its uh completeness, because there's a word lunga that means uh complete, right? So um, and then there's other ones where he he fully says. Kalunga is the completely complete being, right? And and, and so I'm trying to find he, you know, it's in the text, and I'm trying to see if I can find it real quick so I can quote him directly. Um, I can't find it at the moment, uh, but you know, but he he mentions it over and over again in African cosmology of the Bantu Congo. So this is what I'm I'm referencing in in this particular section here. But it's a completely complete being, right? This so we're dealing with the Lunga part complete. So now let's let's go into and compare Kikongo with Chikam, which is what I call the language of the ancient Egyptian. So we can see that where ancient Egypt has TM consonant sequence kikongo has l and then n or the l becomes nasalized and becomes n right and it should be noted that the l originates from a d sound and so but it becomes d again if the l is followed by an i or the l is prefixed by n so that's why this timim right here, a wooden chest, is cognate with indunga drum, a long conical and uh, wooden drum, right? Timer, troop of soldiers or a group of soldiers, indunga, crowd, multitude, host, great number of people, a party, an assembly, a company, a gang, right? And so, uh, itim to be clogged, to be overflowing. Langa to inundate, deluge, overflow, swamp. So you can see that this is a regular correspondence between ancient Egyptian TM and Kikongo L -ng, or N -ng, or D -ng, because of the N prefix or it being followed in this case is D because it's both prefixed by N and it is also followed by I. And so here's some more. So Tim to be complete, complete. Lunga to come to, to amount to, to be complete in number and quantity, to be exact, just, accurate, right, perfect, expired, fulfilled, legally right, all come, all to hand, all present. So when we when Fukiao says Kalunga is a completely complete being. This is this is because this is where the word atom comes from. When you say the word atom, it means the complete one, right? Tim to cease to perish, Tim to be over, Indingalala, halt, pause the land, to merit ancestress mother, Ningwa mother. No matter where we go, we're seeing the the, the same consonant sequence. Right, and I show how that same sequence is cognate with my because, as you can see here, lunga also means just, accurate, right, perfect, expired, and this is exactly what my means. Right, so, um, so I won't get into any other because that's going into the presentation. So make sure all of you um, hit up Got Kush TV so y'all can get the. Uh, y'all could be part of the conversation on quantum field theory as African heritage. So that's part of that lecture. So I gave you a little preview of what's in that mug. So uh, be there, be square, as we would say.
So let me go back up and try to get through these. And let me see. Let me go down some more. Let me do this uh, banner there. So let me go back here. Um, peace and blessings to Mr. Metro on Koba Dejid. He says, so I'll give them some Fontan Moja. <laughs> uh, you said Cardinal Points on past color. Um, I don't know what conversation y'all having over there. Robert Ram, peace and blessings to you, good brother. And Sat 12, so I mean, what is your theory on the origin of the face glyph? Some say the features are relatively broader than other Egyptian art, although they do resemble some art, such as Amenhotep III. Um, it's clear that these are um, the, the, the African folks in the quote-unquote Nubia going to Aswan that you can see. And I've, and I've taken a lot of photos myself of the hieroglyph. And of course, you can find that word all over Africa. Um, it's, it's, it's not, so that is, it's, it's not a doubt where the origins of that face glyph comes from. Um, AFD, one of my friends in Kenya comes from a family, uh, called Kamuta. Interesting. Um, well, we would have to figure out what language and what that word means to see if there's any kind of correlation to, uh, the word Kemet, which I'm assuming that you're, uh, how does Atom become Kalunga? Um, it's not Atom becomes Kalunga. Atom is cognate with Kalunga. And so um, hopefully you understand the nature of um, sound meaning correspondences. And I, I don't have time to give a lesson today on that. Um, he says, that doesn't make sense to me. All right. Again, you, you would have to be, uh, we would have to introduce you to the to the field of historical comparative linguistics uh, that we don't have time for uh, tonight. Uh, let me see. This is why not some of the creator? Uh, or is that a question for me or for someone in a chat? Um, what about similarities to the languages of Burkina Faso? Recently, Mr. Mhotep shared a post implying Sankara Mhotep III name is the same as a former president of Sankara. What are your thoughts? There are similarities, um, and I would have to, and um, excuse if y'all can hear, you know, I'm, I'm not too far from Broad Street in North Philly right now. So, you know, uh, they out with the bikes, you know, so if you, if you know Philly, is 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 dirt bike season until it gets uh the the roads get icy but um so you'll hear all that kind of noise in the background so i do apologize if you do hear that um, but back to your question know that the word sankara is is not uh related to the ancient egyptian word sa ra and ka first of all those each one of those words is 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 more so ser Ker, um, and then Ra is more closer to Orisha in terms of pronunciation than it is. Um, so it's he's he's trying to uh, he's trying to make a connection based upon how we pronounce pronunciate the or transliterate the ancient Egyptian uh, words using. Um, the the Latin letters. So we use the capital A uh, for an actual R sound, and um, so it is. They it wouldn't sound nothing like Sankara. Uh, so this is this is why you know we have these discussions so that people can uh, understand it is more to making linguistic connections than. Than making um, than than words appearing to look alike, and so we we try to avoid lookalikes. It says Atom is an important deity. The Greek studied. I know you have done some work on Maat and the Congolese. Exactly. Um, Simazam Zombie. I don't know. He's just 
unchallenged. It sounds good. Again, people don't think y'all read and study taking a stance. That's why when we write text, we always have citations and 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 the like. And and we also have a method section so that you can follow the methodology and know what the standards are. So uh, there is a very interesting, helpful, how come the Congolese inherited more of the ancient Egyptian cosmological concepts compared to other African groups? Um, and, and I do apologize beforehand, but I'm going to correct you. The ancient Egyptians, excuse me, the Congolese did not inherit ancient Egyptian concepts. The Bokongo and the ancient Egyptians inherited concepts from the mother culture and language because ancient egyptian in congo and, and key congo are related languages that's why they have the same concepts and so this is one of the things i don't know if you were here from the very beginning but this is one of the reasons why i stress not trying to make the argument that just because you see uh relationships in terms of the languages and concepts or you see similarities in terms of practice that the modern cultures inherited this or got it from ancient egypt that's that's not how this this works you know it, it's they are they are sister languages sister cultures and and what is similar to those two um was the result of inheritance and it's actually the Bakongo people who have the more ancient traditions and the, even the more ancient way of pronunciating the words. You can tell there was a lot of sound change that happened when the, 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 the cultures moved from the Great Lakes up into Egypt. Kikongo actually preserves the more ancestral way of pronunciating these uh, African concepts. And, and that's why I stress, you know, the the comparative method. Uh, and, and I try to introduce y'all to historical linguistics and try to get y'all familiar with these concepts so that, you know, when people are just thinking, so you know how to make proper academic arguments, right? Because you want to be careful about, you know, wording things in this way. Because just like Lilius Holmberger, any type of uh, so-called advancement amongst the Africans, the, the, the non-Egyptian Africans, they're always going to attribute it to ancient Egyptians who they believe were white people. And so that's what Lilius, Dr. Lilius Holmberg, Holmberger did in her early works. So she's saying she noticed all the the correlations between ancient Egyptian and in Yoruba and Mande and Wolof and Fulani and Somali and Hausa, et cetera. But she argued that they got their entire culture and language and civilization from the ancient Egyptians. And so this is a super hyper diffusion argument. Because now they can argue, of course, because they've been arguing that the ancient Egyptians were kind of white people and that, you know, black folks were just sitting there, so-called black Africans, true Negroes were sitting up there twiddling their thumbs, mumbling until these white saviors came into Africa and gave them civilization. I wish because I have a uh, matter of fact, I have one of her books in my car and and. um if if I if if I would have thought about it earlier, I would have got it out out the car, and and I and I can read verbatim what she says along those lines. So we always got to be careful how we word these arguments. He they, the the Bakongo did not inherit ancient Egyptian cosmological arg, uh, concepts. One could argue actually the opposite, that the Egyptians inherited Bakongo concepts in cosmology, or whatnot. But, you know, uh, there's there's lots of groups that 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 maintain and keep these things. And so, you know, I always argue again, the Amazulu, the Bakongo, the Baluba, the Yoruba, 
the icon, the uh and and they actually existed in Egypt, so it's understandable there. But they they all originate out of Sudan anyway. The the uh, the collagen, the atroli, the doluo. There's there's many groups that that have this, and so that's that's why I make the argument I make that. So when you're looking at ancient Egyptian phenomena, it's not unique to them. They had a unique way of expressing it because they had the medium to do so you know they had rocks everywhere they had a dry climate where everything could be preserved but when you're talking about the people who lived in the sahel and in the forest they didn't have those luxuries so it remains in the minds and the culture and the language of the people whereas the ancient egyptians were able to preserve it on papyri and on on the monuments because they had stone in abundance there's no stone monuments in the middle of the congo you know it's mad trees so let me go uh yep let's say uh if there is a kimmy refers to irrigated land how do we now how do we now they were also referring to black color the soil appears even blacker in this already dark gray color that's all explained in uh chapter three you'll get the full actually and in the introduction you'll get some argument because it's a two-part argument in the introduction uh, when I'm dealing with uh, Capo Chichi, Dr. Capo Chichi, and in Chapter Three. But in short, um, we we know based upon uh, several factors, and and primarily because of the internal cognizant language, and also the classifiers and how the the word was actually used in the primary text. And so, it's not to say that there weren't some folks who um mistook the word kim the, uh, the word kim meaning black and then the, the place name egypt but you know even if we were to look at coptic they're not even pronounced the same so it's like it's like me confusing the word hat with the word hut remember the ancient egyptians didn't write out their vowels so it only looks the same to us because we only see the consonant skeleton but if we, you know, understand in English, we know there's a big difference between hat and hut or hat and heat. You wouldn't confuse these concepts at all. And it's the same in ancient Egypt. Uh, it's compared to linguistics, but the connotations are there. I don't know. He's addressing someone else there. Uh, how could Kilunga is Kalunga? be the same as autumn linguistically substantially they mean the same thing complete the whole but linguistically that doesn't make sense to me again i don't have time to explain to you sound meaning correspondences at this time uh you just have to kind of again see and and actually um, i'm glad you made that statement because this is why the the first chapter chapter one is dealing with methodology and it explains historical comparative linguistics and it gives you the citations on its importance what is meaning and how you can determine what is a cognate or not because linguistics is not a common tool that folks use you know you you have to be a serious academic to use and know about historical comparative linguistics if you're just a joe schmo on the street and you're just doing self-study it's not going to come naturally to you because it's mathematics it's a it's a, it's a mathematical and, and and logical um phenomena in terms of of academics and so I, I made sure that i took the time out to explain for the lay person what historical comparative linguistics is why it's very important how to avoid certain pitfalls and the like so that you can understand how kalunga is cognate with the word autumn 
for example, that that wasn't the focus of the text. How the hell does Bantu Congo have anything to do with ancient Egyptian? Yeah, you're showing cognitives. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you mean cognates through etymology just because the word or the vowels have the same sounds doesn't mean I don't even know what you are uh, trying to say. Again, for folks like Rasu Allah, LCOB podcast, this is why you you have a method section so that people will understand because this is not it's like you know like folks are not going to have a, an intuitive understanding of quantum field theory or quantum mechanics right because you you have to know physics first then then you have to you know have to know a lot of math right and graph theory and 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 trig and all this other kind of stuff is 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 not something that is is just going to come intuitively to you and so stuff has to be explained and i try my best as not to confuse to kind of simplify so people can understand what comparative linguistics is and how it is utilized in uh historical studies right because if you know you just looking at it, it's going to confuse you but you have to learn step by step it's like you're not going to learn algebra until you learn basic addition multiplication subtraction division so that's the basis of everything addition multiplication subtraction division if you don't understand that you can't just hop in and in, in jump into algebra and you just not without understanding algebra you're not going to jump into calculus right if, if you if if you don't know anything about for example um discrete mathematics for you know for example you're not going to be able to understand software development computer science it's, it's just impossible if you don't understand logic right like argumentation truth tables logic tables and the like you're not going to understand computer science uh electrical engineering and the like these are not intuitive things they're they're cumulative you build on them over time and so you know that's what these discussions bring to the table to help people to understand that it's it's some work but hopefully over time the more and more we have these conversations the more and more you start understanding like oh i get it I see you like it'll start coming to you'll be able to see, you know, when you read these these texts from, you know, other scholars who who do linguistic work and make these arguments in terms of language and linguistics in terms of relationships between ancient Egyptian and, you know, modern African languages. Dasharav says tough crowd tonight. Oh, it's a tough crowd every night. It says uh, I am subscribed for the Kush presentation uh exactly thank you uh for that this is great information once again it says i never really understood fukiao's work but it's good to have an interpreter oh fukiao is the king and you know i've been i've been blessed to have uh gift been gifted you know five of his unreleased text which you know we 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 hope to get published soon but you know he has even more stuff there that you know the world would, would benefit from uh and it's in english so he has other works in french too um let me see does it mean to have the same meaning i speak spanish and arabic and have a cognitive what a vowel saying does it mean so i, I get it um english is not his first language so you know and and you got to understand that you'll have spanish words that um are similar to arabic because uh the the muslims the arabs and and moors ruled spain for a very long time and arabic was the lingua franca and was the language of prestige so spanish has a lot of arabic loan words so they there's those similarities between Arabic and Spanish would not be cognate. All right. Uh, let me see. Here. 
And if, if, so if we see a connection between Chikan and various Bantu languages, which came first? And the ancestor languages, the, the mother tongue came first. So you, we must not confuse, you know, and, and it's to an extent, this is for me, it's not really a well-formed question because Egyptian is a Bantu language. And um, and I know that's going to take some argument. We have to have a separate uh, conversation about that. But it's, it itself is an into, it's a Bantu language. And, and so, you know, modern Bantu, that's what I'm saying, like with Kikongo, for example, Kikongo and Chiluba, and to an extent, Luganda are closer to the proto-Bantu um, than all the other Bantu languages. But Egyptian falls within the same uh, language category as Bantu. He says, after I read your book, I sent it to a friend of mine who has an MD. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to work on your English because MD stands for medical doctor here. So I'm assuming you mean a, a master's or a PhD in linguistics. So that's fine. Please give it to them. Love their feedback. He says, yeah, get him, because judging by your typing, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he says, we ever uh, consider publishing ebooks or your books? Maybe in the future, but at this time, uh, no. Uh, Rather, I saw, are you familiar with the Pan African language movement? Um, if so, not under that name. I know that. You know, for a long time, people have been promoting Kiswahili as being the uh, Pan-African language of prestige uh, to, to be able to communicate across the 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 continent. So is is that what you're talking about? Uh, please retype in in the comment section. So let me go uh, OK, let me see. It says the Pan-African language movement is striving to take 12 basic languages and develop a common written language. Um, yeah, I, I don't see what the point of that would be. Just choose one language and let that be the, the lingua franca for all of Africa, which most people have been voting key Swahili. Uh, uh, since I agree, we can say they mostly definitely inherited multiplication from the Congo. I just learned about it. Ishango bone. Exactly. Um, and matter of fact, that's something that I discussed in an old paper that I wrote for a local paper in, in, in Houston dealing with mathematics uh, and its inheritance uh, in ancient Egypt. He says, Brother Sarge, your presentation available on live stream tomorrow. Um... I don't know if the conference is live streaming. I know they did some live streaming recording, but I have brought my camera with me. So I can't live stream with this camera, uh, but I will be recording my presentation or I have somebody record it for me while I'm up there speaking. And then I'm going to put it in the uh the patreon for all the patreon members so i know sister Gigi is one of our patreon members and um if you're not a patreon member i would encourage you to join uh the patreon page which is patreon.com forward slash asar motel so y'all be able to see the um, video first but i'm also going to put up there um brother sanjetti uh, cause Sanjeti actually, so this will be, it's not his first time attending the Shekhan to Diop conference, but this is his first time presenting at the Shekhan to Diop conference. So I'm going to be recording, uh, his, uh, presentation as well. And I'll put it up in Patreon. And, uh, so let me see, let me see Um, damn, lost my place. 
Um, let's see. Let me scroll down. Result online, you're funny. Um, six forms I had to learn. Let me see. Are you saying the audience doesn't read? Are you doing? Yeah, I don't know who Donnie Williams is, is arguing with. Uh, yeah, the, the, the link is at the top of the chat. Um, let me see. Plutarch was very clear in his Osiris and the Isis that Kemet Kamiya referred to black skin with moisture and the contradiction to the foreigners who were described as red and pale with no moisture. Um, I could tell you did not read Plutarch. And regardless, in the introduction, um, this it's actually two parts. So part one of the discussion of Plutarch in part two is well, part one is in the introduction and part two is in chapter three of the text. So if you get and read the text, you'll you'll be able to see the arguments because Plutarch. Well, I don't even know who where you got that from, because no one even interprets it like that. But um, I have the raw text in there and I get a transliteration and we translate and we're, and we're showing here that um, most people's reading of Plutarch is wrong. And, and matter of fact, and, and just to make sure when I went and did it, I went and consulted several uh, scholars of Greek language and history and philosophy. And only one disagreed with me and I put his disagreement in here. Everyone else agreed with my interpretation. And then I showed how, how everybody's interpretation has to be wrong because there's no, for example, there's no native word Kim or Kemet in the Egyptian language meaning pupil, right? And so I may do a, a whole presentation just on that. And so this is why it's important to go into the raw text. Um, let me see, or oh, you can just type for me in the rest of the chat, I guess. Uh, if she kind of the oldest one, we know compared to other Bantu languages people speak today, huh? Chikam is how you spell it there. If you see me put Chikam like that, I'm talking about ancient Egyptian language. And so he says, if Chikam is a Bantu language, is it the oldest one uh, we know of compared to other Bantu languages? N not necessarily. And so we got to know the difference between something truly being an older form or the oldest versus attested right so for example many of the or well, most of africa did not have writing like we do today and you know we don't we don't have any written forms of their languages you know earlier than with the exception of marotic and gaez and and all that other kind of stuff before like the 1600s um or a little bit earlier for when the uh, arabs were invading certain parts of west africa right like in mali but but outside of those like before the 1600s you, there's no written form of these languages but just because they were written down in 1600 let's just choose that as an arbitrary date just because it was written down in 1600 doesn't mean that the language started then Right. And so you you can't go by, you know, oldest or youngest as it regards to being um, being written down or not written down, you know. So remember, for example, that English did not wasn't written down until they received writing coming out of uh rome and french actually when the french took over right they, you start having writings but when the, when the french were overthrown in england and english became the language of prestige now now you get english writing but english has been there so you can't say that english you know is younger or older based upon the emergence of the writing of english and so you can't say that again with the ancient Egyptian 
or with the, for example, Kikongo language, because, you know, uh, we just say that Egyptian is the oldest attested African language in terms of written down. It's not the oldest language, right? Uh, he says, Black Hat, Me Day, Ya, peace and blessings. Thank you for joining. Uh, let's see. He said, Record Meek Mill parading down your street with the ADV. It, you know, he probably, he, he probably didn't pass by already. Uh, Africa World says, We see African. How about we have regional languages, one for West Africa, one for Central Africa? In the South Africa, because we already have regional languages like Swahili is. I would I would argue against it because that's that's too many national languages. You know, we, you're just looking for one lingua franca, right? So, like, you know, English is the lingua franca for the United States, Europe, uh, parts of Africa, uh, Australia, New Zealand parts of Asia and in India, they speak English, right? It's, it's a singular, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's Dutch over here, that's that's too many, you know? And that's why when people are trying to, when, when the United States or England wants to uh, exert influence around these places, they can do so because everyone speaks the, the lingua franca, which is English. And so you want to have one language for which you can communicate all across Africa. Everybody learns their language, and then everybody learns, for example, Kiswahili as a second language, so that you can communicate with people. So now, so so if, let's just assume we break Africa down into five regions, right? Now, you know, to be able to communicate with everybody in Africa, I got to learn an additional, you know, four other languages. Like that's 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 unnecessary and that's too much. Pick one language. And, and and move forward with that. Let's see. Uh, and peace and blessings and thank you. Yeah, I got to get off. Out of fact, I got to get off of here now because um, again, my presentation is in the morning at 10, 1030 or 1040. So, you know, if y'all are just joining the conversation um, in North Philly right now, uh, at Temple University uh, for the Sheikh Anta Diop International Conference, uh, which is today, well, which was yesterday because it's 12.08 now, and um, tomorrow, uh, which was today, the 14th. So yesterday, the 13th, today's the uh, 14th. So uh, both Brother Sanjeti and I are presenting on tomorrow. And so... I do appreciate everyone. So I didn't realize the time. So whatever comments or questions I didn't get to answer, I do apologize beforehand. And so I'll go back over these and we'll just have to do it again. But um, I got to go over my presentation uh, for tomorrow. Get ready uh, for the the second part of the conference. So. I do appreciate each and every one of you for joining this conversation and uh, thank all of you who have uh, donated to the channel and um, I do appreciate each and every one of you once more. And so until next time and make sure that you get the text, but I will see you all on Probably next Saturday, I'm going to do a show. Probably next Saturday or Sunday. So uh, there's going to be some 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 changes I want to uh, inform you all of. So until next time, y'all be easy. Peace.
Corona. Those that. What's up? Feeling like I dropped a drop for and caught Uno. Yeah. Came to kick the door while the gang man drew up. Pin game low. That's why they give me kudos. Uh -huh. Spy by the 3 0. 595, check it for oh, a pack like. Hit the turn price, slide to a baseline. Got a sound like I just hit the 8 5. Oh, I'm so ready. By enemies necessary, we gon' be legendary. Hold up. Mm. About to grow the payrolls. If you see the vision and you're with it, you should say so. Cause we about building, elevating the millions.